welcome to welcome to the LSA Honors Program's Parents and Family um, Information Session and Q and A. Um, I will run through some slides with you and provide as much helpful information about the program as possible. And there's plenty of time for questions. So please do feel free to ask questions and we will get answers out to you. Let me move the next slide. Um, I will introduce myself briefly and then I'll ask uh, Becca and Rohit to introduce themselves. And then I'll move on to the uh, program for the evening and more introductions. So, Becca, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sorry, Lisa. Um, I'm Becca Wyeth. I'm the program assistant for the LSA Honors Program. So I work a lot with admissions and orientation for incoming first year students. Hi, my name is Rohit. I am an honors academic peer advisor. I'm currently a rising sophomore majoring in molecular, cellular and developmental biology and I am tentatively on a pre-med track. Thank you both. So Becca is running the show behind the scenes and both Becca and Rohit will answer questions and I'll do my best to pick up questions as well. Um, okay, so skip to slide. Uh, goals for this session. I will introduce you to the honors program team. Um, we'll talk about the mission of our program and in that section, I'll cover information about LSA degree requirements because all honors students must meet LSA degree requirements. Um, we have our own specific requirements. We have an opportunity called the Sophomore Honors Award, which I'll describe in some detail. I'll talk about what it means to graduate with honors. Again, always time for questions and answers. We'll move on to a portion of our presentation about housing um, and the programming that we put on to foster community within honors, which is very important to us. And then I will talk about honors advising and FERPA. So as promised, introductions to our team. We are directed by Mika Levake manti who is um, a Thurnau Professor of Political Science. Thurnau professors are distinguished for their excellence in undergraduate teaching. So we're really delighted to have Mika as our faculty director. He teaches one of our core courses that also meets the first year writing requirement called Honors 240 Wellness. So that's a wonderful opportunity that some students will have to take part in this fall. Um, our assistant director, Gail Green, um, oversees admissions and is our liaison to to honors housing. So you may have already interacted with Gail as well as with Becca um, throughout the admissions and early stages of orientation um, processes. Um, there's me at the top right. I'm the associate director and the director of advising for our program. And in the bottom right corner of the screen, you see Henry Dyson. Dr. Dyson is our director of the Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships. Now, the Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships, which we call um, shorthand ONSF, is housed within honors. And we're really proud to have that office within our program, but it serves all 19 schools and college at the university. And the reason we're really delighted to house ONSF is because many honor students make excellent candidates for these very competitive and prestigious awards, such as the Rhodes Scholarship, the Marshall Scholarship, and so on. More staff introductions. We have a fantastically talented team um, of administrative staff. You see here Haley Charbonneau, who is our outreach and engagement coordinator. She will be communicating with students on a regular basis uh, throughout the academic year and also planning lots of events. Um, in addition to the events that I'll describe uh, later on in our presentation, you see Barb Frecka, our administrative coordinator. Barb handles many functions behind the scenes, but one way in which your student may interact with Barb would be if they apply for an honors research and travel grant, Barb would be the person to disperse funds to them. Um, but she also performs many other administrative functions. Jacqueline Turkovich is our academic auditor. I should pause and say that we are a full service advising unit. And so we're very proud to have our own academic auditor. Jacqueline is immensely talented and keeps 
many years of the university bulletin stored in her brain. So she is ace at keeping students on track, making sure that they've met all the requirements to graduate. Um, and then you've met Becca. Um, Mackenzie Loftus is the program assistant for the Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships. Our academic advising team includes the people you see here, with one exception, we don't have a photograph of Sydney. Um, Stephanie Chervin is our pre-health advisor and also a general advisor. Denise Gio, pre-law advisor. John Cantu has been with our program for many years and knows the university inside and out. Gail Green, who you have seen on an earlier slide, slide is also an advisor and our assistant director. I also serve as an advisor. And Sydney Awada has joined us as an academic advising intern. So your students may encounter any of us advisors um, throughout the summer and definitely throughout the academic year. So what is the LSA Honors Program? The Honors Program is premised on the idea that's, that students who like to challenge themselves and are intellectually curious should have an academic home within the rich LSA college. We wanna make a giant university and a very large college a bit smaller. Um, we like to make sure that students have the opportunity to explore and really get the most out of their experience at Michigan. It's important to know that the LSA Honors Program is not a university-wide program. It is specific to the College of LSNA. Um, so there are other honors programs in the university. Uh, I believe the College of Engineering has a small one, but we are the largest living and learning community within the College of LSNA. And as I mentioned at the outset, honor students still fulfill the same requirements that the college uh, requires to earn a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science degree. The degree requirements for a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science degree, 120 credits by the uh, time a student graduates. And what we know is that if a student takes on average 15 credits a semester for eight semesters, they will hit that 120 credit mark within four years. Um, so throughout orientation, when we're speaking to students, we talk to them about the appropriate course load. Um, we tend to talk in terms of credit hours, but courses can range from one to four or five credits. So what your student schedule looks like may differ from another student's schedule, but typically someone would register for three, four, or maybe five classes per term. And each course is typically three or four credits. So what does a student do as they're on their way to that 120 um, credit requirement? About 20% of their time is spent fulfilling college requirements. And those include first year writing and upper level writing. And those are two distinct classes. One nice thing about the honors curriculum is that our first year writing course also carries distribution credit. And distribution credit coupled with first year writing actually helps students speed up their time to graduation just by a fraction. Now, we're not interested really in rushing students through the college experience by any means, but when they're taking a first year writing course that also carries humanities credit or social science credit, it means they're getting a really enriched experience that they can't get anywhere else in the university. All LSA students and honor students must take a quantitative reasoning course or courses. The quantitative reasoning requirement can be satisfied with one course. Um, that's called a QR1. And courses such as mathematics and statistics will meet that requirement in one fell swoop. But there are other courses that meet half of the requirement, such as Economics 101 and Economics 102. So put together, two QR2 courses would satisfy the quantitative reasoning requirement. And one thing that's important to know, and it's especially important for students to know this, is that the quantitative reasoning requirement may be met 
outside of mathematics or economics. We have communications classes, philosophy classes, sociology classes, computer science classes, all of which um, can satisfy the quantitative reasoning requirements. So throughout orientation, we work carefully with students to help identify the quantitative reasoning classes they may want to take um, at some point in their time at Michigan. All LSA students must reach what we call fourth term proficiency in a second language. We offer a placement test so that students may not have to begin taking a language at the 101 level. A student may place into third semester or fourth semester language, and that's a very nice thing. Um, a student may place out of the language requirement based on their AP, IB score, or their placement exam. Um, but if a student has no experience in a second language, they would need four terms uh, to reach proficiency. All LSA and honor students must take a race and ethnicity course, one course. And we help students identify those courses um, during orientation. And if they don't take a race and ethnicity course in their first term, they have seven more semesters to do that. So that's about 20% of a student's time in LSA. When students declare a major, and that happens typically at the end of sophomore year or the beginning of junior year, there is absolutely no pressure for a student to declare a major right out of the gate. They will spend about 25 to 40% of their time working on major requirements. You see here that some majors have as few as 28 credits required, and then there is one major out there that requires 50 credits. But the vast majority of majors in LSA are 30, 32 credits. Um, so a student will be taking about 25 to 30% of their coursework in the major. Distribution. Student spends about 25% of their time at the university fulfilling distribution requirements. And that sounds rather dull, but it's actually one of my favorite things about the college that we have this distribution requirement. It really asks a student to stretch, to learn things outside of their major. Um, and that's what LSA is all about. As a liberal arts college, we want people to explore. And we know that honor students are intellectually curious and they're up for that. So distribution is not uh, a drudge it's a good thing. We ask all students to meet the requirement by taking seven credits of humanities, seven social science credits, seven natural science credits outside of their major. So that earns them 21 distribution credits. And then we ask them to do nine additional credits. And at this point, they have options. They might take additional humanities courses, social science or natural science courses, but they could also choose creative expression courses a course that fulfills something called mathematical and symbolic analysis credit, or something that is designated as interdisciplinary, which truly does blend multiple disciplines together. What's left over? A student spends the remainder of their time taking elective courses. Many honors students will choose to organize those electives into a second major or a minor or a couple of minors. And sometimes a student will just take courses that they think are fascinating and they want to you know, seize the opportunity while they're an undergraduate. Um, and there's not a requirement to organize those electives in any particular way. Although the most common way is to put them into a second major or a minor. So we think about the LSA honors program as one program that can be divided into two parts. The first part is the part that I'll focus on most this evening, although I will touch on the upper division portion a bit. The first part of our program is what we call the learning community phase. And it focuses on first and second year students. Students tend to, to enter this phase of our program through um, the winter admissions process. And then they go through summer orientation as your students are likely doing now. Uh, we admit approximately 400 students per year, and we monitor our admissions very carefully because we want to make sure that we can serve those students through advising and with housing placements to the very best of our ability. In the learning community phase, 
students are taking honors core courses. They're participating in our specially designed curriculum to meet first year writing requirements and distribution requirements. It's not necessary that a student do all of their distribution in the first two years, although it is typical that students get a lot of that done. Some students like to save a little bit of the distribution for their senior year so they have something different. You know, when they're focused on major requirements, they get a little something, you know, outside of the major, you know, to do um, on the side. Many of our students live in honors housing. Now, we are a learning community as opposed to a living and learning community because we do not require students to live in South Quad. It's a wonderful option, and many of our students take us up on that option. South Quad is proximate to everything, and it's a lovely residence, um, but we don't call ourselves a living and learning community because we allow students to live elsewhere. And that's very nice because if a student is a part of another living and learning community that does have a residential requirement, such as the residential college or um, maybe a health science focused program, with a residential requirement, we're very happy that they're in both communities and it's fine for them to live elsewhere and participate in everything that Honors has to offer. In the living, uh, the learning community phase, we recognize students who have fully participated in our curriculum and, and in our community building activities through something called the Sophomore Honors Award. And I will definitely be talking a little bit more about the Sophomore Honors Award um, in a few minutes. The second half of our program, we refer to as the major phase. Um, it, it's typically something students do in their third and fourth year when they have decided to declare a major. A student might say, I've come to realize that I, I really love physics and I'm gonna be a physics major and I wanna take a deep dive into the subject. So I'm gonna declare an honors major. What that means is a commitment to doing independent research and writing a thesis in their field. So a student will declare a major and then declare the honors major. And that keeps them in the honors program for years three and four. There is typically no thesis in mathematics. So if a student is an honors math student, they will take advanced coursework. Now, some departments do have additional required courses in junior or senior year, but those courses are designed to support students who are working on independent projects that lead into the, the writing of their thesis. So it doesn't really delay a student, it supports a student in, in their goals toward graduation. There is a second way of staying in honors for, their, for students third and fourth year, and that's called honors in the engaged liberal arts. We call it HELA. Honors in the Engaged Liberal Arts is a community engaged project. We ask students to think, how have your academics informed your thinking about a problem that you have identified in any community in the world? Um, or how have your academics shaped your ability to think about enhancing an asset that you've identified in a community somewhere in the world? How can you solve the problem that you've noticed, or how can you enhance access to the asset? Now, we know students have a lot of community commitments. So if they're not, if the uh, thesis option resulting in a monograph is not appealing, but a student really wants to be a change agent, the honors in engaged liberal arts pathway can be ideal for those students. Honors has minimum requirements. So I've already reviewed the college requirements. Honors requirements are that they take, the students take an honors core first year writing course. This academic year, we're offering three honors first year writing courses. The first is called Great Books, which is our longest standing first year writing opportunity. Um, I believe Great Books has been taught for almost 60 years since the inception of the program. The second option is Honors 240 Wellness taught by our faculty director. And the third option is Honors 241 Westworld and the Philosophy of Mind. Um, as I mentioned, all of those first year writing courses carry distribution credit. 
in two cases, humanities, and in one case, social science. We ask that students maintain a cumulative GPA of a 3.4. And I will pause here to say that at the end of every semester, we look at every single honor student's academic record. And we take note, if a student is doing well, we send notes of congratulation and congratulations and encouragement. If a student is struggling, they stay with our program, but we reach out to them and say, how can we help you um, realize your academic potential? What strategies can we help you develop so that you reach th the 3.4 that we're asking you to reach? I really enjoy that portion of our, what we call academic review, because it means no student falls through the cracks and it's a very supportive system. We do ask that students declare an honors major if they're interested in staying in the program in their junior year. So when a student earns around 55 credits, we begin to remind them, now is the time to think about declaring your major and declaring the honors version of the major. Or if that's not the plan, thinking about the honors and engaged liberal arts pathway. To do honors and engaged liberal arts, a student needs to declare that path two to three semesters before graduation. We want them to have ample time to really dig in and solve problems in their community or, or build something um, useful in their community. Honors core courses, a little bit more information about those. They are designed specifically for honor students. Uh, they are taught on a three-year rotation. We think of honors as something of a laboratory for academic and curricular innovation. Um, some of the best faculty in the, in the university um, approach honors or we reach out to them and say, we know, we know you've got some wonderful ideas for a course. Let's test it out in honors. Uh, they're typically enormously successful and the departments want them back after three years. So the example here um, that's first given, what is cancer? It was an interdisciplinary course taught, um, team taught by a biologist and a sociologist. Wildly popular. We kept it in honors as long as we could. And then uh, the department said, we would like to move this course back um, to offer to even more students. So lots of wonderful courses are developed within honors. And then you see the other examples that I've already mentioned. All of our courses, despite having a particular distribution assignation, social science humanities, are truly broad and interdisciplinary. So a course like wellness will take on the question of the wellness industry from a, from a social science perspective, but there will be a lot of humanities elements as well. What does it mean to be well and to take care of oneself as a university student and so on? I should also say that honors courses are limited to honor students only. So that makes um, it possible for conversations to be uh, complex, elevated, interesting. You're surrounded by other honor students who are really kind of pushing the envelope on the, the subjects that they're involved in. Before I turn to the sophomore honors award, are there any questions that I need to address? Um, honors community building activities. I will definitely be talking about community building activities and Rohit is typing an answer. Thank you. Um, other questions. Are there honors options for each of the honor uh, math major variations? There are not. Uh, there is one honors math track and the other tracks do not have honors options. That doesn't mean that a student might not take an honors math course. Um, but if a student is majoring in financial math, for instance, it would not be honored the same as honors math. Uh, another question, would international students need to take a second language course? Would their native language satisfy the second language? Um, yes, in many cases that does happen. Um, we have some criteria that students need to meet. They need to have taken middle school or high school instruction in their native language. Um, or they can demonstrate proficiency through a placement exam. 
but that is often, it is often the case that a student who already speaks a second language will place out of the language requirement. Okay, I'll turn now to the Sophomore Honors Award and that will help me uh, begin discussing our community um, activities. So the Sophomore Honors Award recognizes students who have really embraced all that honors has to offer. Uh, students who have earned engagement points, which we help them track through a program called GradeCraft. And I will come back to engagement points in some detail in just a moment. Students need to have completed an honors core class that meets our first year writing requirement. And that's our minimum requirement. And then to earn the sophomore honors award, they'll need to have completed an additional honors core course not all honors core courses are first year writing courses. Um, a student is welcome to take more than one first year writing, but they might choose to take something that's not first year writing. Uh, in the winter term, we will be offering a humanities course that is philosophy based. And in the sophomore year, we'll be offering um, a slate of new courses that are exciting and still are in development. And we also ask students to maintain the cumulative GPA of 3.4 with a maximum of one elective pass-fail class. We want students to be able to take a risk, take a class that they may not feel most comfortable in, and they can take that pass-fail because exploring and risk-taking, uh, we believe are important. Um, so we, we do give students that opportunity to take one optional pass-fail course. Now, how does a student earn the 24 engagement points that we ask them to earn in order to be awarded the Sophomore Honors Award. They can do it through curricular work. For every honors core course, a student earns a point for each credit that the course carries and all honors core courses are four credits. So by taking an honors first year writing course, a student will earn four points right off the top. Um, other honors courses, that we offer or that departments offer also carry engagement points and the math is the same. There's a point for every credit that the course carries. So in the winter, we'll be offering an honors introduction to psychology called Psych 114. And that would be a four credit or four point course. Honors math classes, um, sections of regular introductory courses, such as women and gender studies you see here. Um, and we advisors will know which sections are designated as honors sections and can help a student identify those in the course guide and as they're planning their schedule. In courses such as organic chemistry, students will have the opportunity of registering for the course this summer. And then in the fall, signing up for something called a structured study group. Um, if a student participates in a structured study group, which enhances their experience as opposed to making it more difficult, they will earn honors credit for the course and their full points. And then in a student's first or second year, if they take what we call an advanced election, they will also earn points according to the number of credits per class. So in a first year, a student taking a 300 or 400 level course would, would earn engagement points. And in a second year, students would earn points for taking a 400 level course. It is not uncommon for an honors incoming student or second year student to take those upper division courses because they have been prepared. They've taken advanced um, courses in their high school. They're ready to dig in. They're excited about learning. So uh, there's no reason a student should be concerned about looking for 300 or 400 level classes. And we advisors can always talk with a student about whether that class is a good idea or not. Um, and then additional language courses beyond the language requirement that are taken in the first semester earn engagement points. Honors conversions are one of my favorite features of the honors program. There are so many wonderful courses in our catalog. And in some cases, there are no designated honors sections or honors equivalents. So when that happens, we offer honors students the opportunity to convert the class into an honors class. The student approaches the professor and asks at the outset, are you amenable? To, to this conversion project. And as long as the professor is amenable to it, we say go for it because it means that the student will do a little bit of additional work 
on a weekly basis, um, something that supplements the, the syllabus that everyone else is following. They will meet with the faculty member on a regular basis every two or every three weeks. And then they'll sum up their learning at the end of the semester with a special project. It could be a paper, it could be a presentation, it could be a study guide that they share with the rest of the students. Um, there, there are many creative ways of summing up that additional learning. And when the conversion is completed successfully, we put honors under the course title on the transcript and the student earns points for the course. The reason conversions are my favorite feature of our honors curriculum is because the student is taking initiative to get to know a faculty member. And through that regular contact, they're developing an ally in a department and they're learning something that's very bespoke that they've designed themselves. And that's very much uh, part of the honors ethos. Finally, we have engagement activities. Uh, these are not the only community building activities that we host, and I will talk more about those in a minute, but we do host um, some planned activities. The first one available to students this summer is called Honors Connect. It's an online platform. Students are conversing with one another through something called Yellow Dig. They're talking about topics that are important to themselves, um, and that are focused largely on wellness and on getting to know one another in the campus community. So a student can participate at various levels in that conversation and earn a point. If a student participates in undergraduate research, they can earn two points per semester, whether or not they are part of the undergraduate research opportunity program. I host a program throughout the academic year called Honors in the Arts, where we go to performances and museums and anything arts related. And we'll have a conversation over coffee after, or we'll um, maybe have a dessert and discuss it. We have an honors diversity, equity, and inclusion course. It's a mini course that starts as an online conversation and then emerges into a set of group conversations about important issues um, and others that uh, crop up throughout the academic year. So students are always informed about these opportunities through our weekly newsletter. So they'll know um, what point opportunities are on the horizon and they'll be able to register for them and participate in them. Honors community. Um, as I mentioned, we house many of our students in South Quadrangle. It is a terrific dorm. We have space for approximately 500 students in South Quad, um, and about 80% of our first year students live in South Quad. Um, the students who do not live in South Quad are typically living in other residence halls uh, by choice because they've decided not to live with an honors roommate. Maybe they've, they have a friend who's not in honors and they wanted to live with someone else, uh, live with that person outside of honors housing or they are in a living and learning community that does have a residential requirement, um, or they might just choose to live off campus. But you can see that the vast majority of our incoming students um, live in honors housing. And then only about 20% of our returning students stay in South Quad. Rohi can say more about this, I'm sure, but I think the reason for that is that students build friendships in South Quad and they say, let's move off campus together into an apartment. Um, they, they just want the independence of off-campus living. But South Quad, I'm told, has the best food um, and it is close to everything. So it's a great place for an incoming student to spend their time. In South Quad, uh, we have honors residential advisors who are there for our students as support, as, as mentors, and they do a lot of planning of community building activities. Now, it does not matter where an honor student lives. They might live in a different residence hall or off campus, but any activity that we plan that emerges from South Quad, a student is invited to participate in. So there's no limit to what activities an honor student can participate in. All residence halls will have residential advisors, but we have our own special team of honors residential advisors who are familiar with our program and who are focused on planning activities to get students together, to get them meeting one another and just enjoying their time together. Our community building 
begins in the summer through the Honors Connect online discussion that I mentioned. Um, but the first in-person activity is kickoff, which happens in August. Um, it is the first time that our entire incoming cohort is able to come together in the Power Center. It's really exciting in a post-pandemic or, or you know, lessening pandemic time to see everyone together. Um, and we like to bring our students together as much as possible from their first days on campus in August through honors graduation. We have our own commencement and award ceremonies. And so it's really nice to be able to see students from day one all the way till their last day as an undergraduate. Um, throughout the year, we have a variety of different programs. Lunch with Honors is one of them, where we bring in a speaker um, and the, the speaker will give a short talk and then literally sit down and have lunch with students and they can ask the, the speaker questions. So it's a great opportunity to get to meet a, a real variety of people. Sometimes we will have a, pre a professional speaker like a doctor or the Dean of Admissions for a met from a medical school. Sometimes we'll have a famous journalist. Um, it's, it's an exciting opportunity to have a great lunch with a speaker. And then our honors faculty and staff plan activities. Um, we will have an uh, advisor leading a dance class, uh, not for credit, but for enjoyment. Um, and we'll have someone offering some cinema viewings or film screenings, I should say. So there are a lot of ways to get to know not only fellow students, but honors uh, faculty and staff as well. I've already touched on the Honors Connect, um, so I, I won't say much more about that opportunity here. It opened on June 7th and runs through August 13th, and so there is still time for a student to join and participate. Honors Communications and Engagement. Our Engagement and Outreach Coordinator, Haley, will begin sending our weekly email newsletter this week in honors to enrolled students in August. Uh, the This week in honors newsletter will contain a lot of important information. And so if I could ask anything, it would be that you ask your students to pay attention to their email when it comes out. Um, we include academic information. Don't forget this deadline is approaching. Here's what you need to know about such and such academic policy. Um, but we will also showcase opportunities to get involved on campus. Some we might say, oh, such and such a professor has announced that she needs a research assistant. Is anyone interested? Contact this address. Um, or we will promote community building activities that the honors resident assistants have planned or that we staff have planned. So there's a lot of good information coming through that newsletter, um, both important policy and social information. Honors maintains social media accounts. Right now we're focused on Facebook and Instagram, but I imagine that we will expand our social media outreach in the coming academic year. Uh, and that will be under the direction of Haley, our engagement coordinator. Okay, questions. I know they're coming in fast and furious. Um, And it seems as though they're all being answered. Thank you so much. Um, do we e email students at their personal email or school email? As soon as students get a unique name, we do all transactions through their UMICH email address. And oftentimes a student using a personal email address um, account rather to reach us, the email will bounce back. So strongly encouraged to use the UMICH address. Um, could I? Yes. Let me go back to the slide. Instagram is at LSA Honors. Is Honors Connect the same as Yellow Dig? Yes. Yellow Dig is the platform through which a student participates in Honors Connect. Someone is saying, I can't see the questions in the q and A. I I don't know if other participants can. Becca, I'm not sure how to address that question. 
the way that Q and A is set up is that only the panelists and hosts can see it, and we just answer the questions to them. So if there are questions that we deem important for the group, then we save them for Lisa to answer out loud. But otherwise, we just answer them individually, one on one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to, being conscious of our time together, um, talk now about honors advising. When a student comes to summer orientation, the student is assigned an honors advisor and that honors advisor will be their college advisor for four years or as long as they stay in the honors program, which we hope is all four years. We do have specialty advisors and students are welcome to see those advisors as well as their assigned advisor. So a student might be assigned to me, but say at the outset, I'm a pre-med student and I would say, oh, you must meet Dr. Stephanie Chervin as soon as possible because she's such a fantastic pre-health advisor. Um, so the student is not limited to seeing their assigned advisor, but we do have an assigned advisor. So they always have that, that resource link. As I mentioned some time ago, we also have the Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships embedded within our office. And so we frequently refer students to Henry and say, this student, you should speak with them. I think they're really interested in public policy and will be a leader in their field. So connect about this opportunity. Um, honors also connects students to advisors outside of our office. So we have a study abroad office. And so we will often start a conversation with a student about study abroad and we'll say, where would you like to go and what would you like to accomplish? Let's talk about some planning, timing, and so on. But then you'll really need to speak to a CGIS um, advisor for the details about the program. And we like to give the experts the opportunity to share the right information. The same is true with financial aid um, and with internships and postgraduate job searches. We have the LSA Opportunity Hub, which is fantastic for helping students connect to extramural experiences and prepare resumes um, for postgraduate job searches. Now, finally, I'll mention major and minor advisors. When a student declares a major or minor, they're assigned another advisor, and that advisor is the specialist within that field. So if a student begins in honors and is assigned an honors advisor, they have that honors advisor for their entire time in honors, and then they will get a biology major advisor. And that person will know the ins and outs of the major and will have the authority to make decisions within the major. And we all work together sort of as a, a team to make sure that the student is getting all the good advising that they need. Are there questions that I can address before talking about FERPA? Will there be scholarship resources for out-of-state students? Now, scholarships is something that we typically direct students to LSA scholarships to discuss um, with those advisors because they have the best information about tuition support. However, Honors does have lovely support for research, travel, um, some study abroad. Uh, it does not matter if the student is in state or out of state. Um, it's a grant process. And so we encourage students to come to us and apply for some support. Um, it's typically not tuition support though. How, should, how soon should a student meet with an advisor in their major? Now I see that Becca is typing an answer. Um, I'm curious to know if Becca will say the same thing I'm going to say, but I'm gonna say as soon as they develop a strong interest in the major, they should meet with an advisor. First to talk about their interest in declaring and to sort of figure out the program, um, but also just to get to know that person because that, that major advisor will be a tremendous resource going forward. Um, can I talk a little bit more about honors versions of standard classes. Um, are these offered in every class at the university or just introductory? And how do they differ from standard classes? There are a variety of ways that an honors class becomes an honors class or differs from a standard class. I, I think all of the classes at the university are fantastic, challenging, um, and enriching. 
One thing that makes an honors course an honors course is that it is limited to honor students only. So it's audience based, only honor students can enroll in it. And we therefore assume that the students are ready to engage deeply in the material and they're excited about being there. Um, another way that an honors class is defined as honors is that the faculty member who offers the lecture also leads the discussion as opposed to having a graduate student instructor lead the discussion. Or in some cases, it may be the faculty member and a graduate student instructor who lead the discussion. But what we're after at that point is more faculty student interaction. Um, another way that an honors class may differ from a standard class is that it may be more accelerated or more, uh, or more complex material or problems may be presented to the students. Um, organic chemistry, as I mentioned some time ago, has what we call a structured study group option. Those are optional. Students sign up for them and they work together in groups on complex problems. And what we find is that students are learning more and their pace is slightly accelerated, but the outcomes are better because they have that support system, the groups, the group study, you know, that makes it an honors class. Um, so there are a real variety of ways that a class can be um, honors. And then again, if there is a class that has no honors option, a student can take on additional work and plan meetings on a routine basis with faculty. And again, that's the, the, the important feature there is getting to know the faculty member and that makes it an honors experience. Um, and then there was another part of the question as well. Are honors options offered at every level or just introductory? Most honors sections are offered in the first and second year, the 100 and 200 level, but we do see some 300 level honors classes. And then when a student is working on a thesis, they will almost certainly be involved in a 300 or 400 level honors only course designed to support that research and thesis uh, work. What percent of students in the lower division continue with the upper division? That number varies quite a bit. Um, I would say approximately, and Becca, you might want to correct me on this because you may have data at your fingertips. I would say. 50% continue on to the upper division portion of our program. Something that I haven't mentioned is that students who transfer into the university or who may not have heard about honors as incoming students have the opportunity to declare an honors major. So we actually have a large number of students join the program as honors majors, never having taken a lower division class. Um, and we're really proud of that opportunity because it means that students are getting the opportunity to take the deep dive in their discipline of interest, um, even if they, they miss the opportunity to be in our first and second year program. Do students graduate with honors if they maintain all the requirements? Um, yes, students graduate with honors um, if they complete the requirements of their major, they maintain the GPA requirement, the honors program's minimum GPA requirement is 3.4. Some departments do have a higher one, 3.5 in some cases. Um, they will submit a thesis or complete an honors and engaged liberal arts project. Um, and Rohit is also contributing to that question um, online. Eugene, you were saying uh, your question is about a mentor, not an advisor. Um, is there something that I can, I think I might have missed the initial question. They were asking about um, how students get in contact with an honors mentor and can request one and go through that process. Okay. Becca, are you, were you going to address that question? I don't know as much about the mentor process. So if you have information about it, Lisa. Okay, I will take that one. Um, so. We have had a variety of different mentoring programs. We've had a peer mentor program where we have several mentors um, that we can connect students to. Uh, we consider our honors resident advisors to be mentors. Um, we have an honors wellness coach, a peer wellness coach who's trained through Wolverine Wellness. Uh, that person can serve as a mentor. 
Um, and any student that is not making a connection, um, we advisors can help identify a mentor. And sometimes that mentor doesn't need to be a peer mentor, it can be a faculty mentor. Um, we're happy to make those connections as well. Okay, so we're approaching the top of the hour and I, I wanna be conscious of our time um, and turn now to the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA. There's, it's just some important information that I need to share with you before we um, disband. On the screen, you'll see a link to a website that provides detailed information about the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. I'll give you a brief overview of it this evening. FERPA means that a student upon turning 18 years old or matriculating at the university um, becomes the sole owner of his or her academic record. Um, that information is private to the student alone and we in the honors program are not allowed to share academic information with anyone other than the student, including tuition paying parents. Um, there's a very limited amount of information that we can share, but here's an example of something that we could not share. A parent might call and say, I'm concerned about my student's performance in Econ 101, can you tell me how she's doing? What's her grade after midterm? We could not share that information because that's protected academic information, uh, private to the student alone. But what we could say is, I could ask your daughter to reach out to you and talk about her performance in econ. What we really do is encourage self-advocacy for the student. We want the student to talk with the important people in their lives about their academic progress. Um, we can always share information that is broad-based and policy-oriented. So if you were to um, ask a question such as, my son is thinking about dropping this course and replacing it with another course, but it's getting late in the semester and I'm not sure what, you know, how to, how, how to handle this. What should I tell him about dropping physics and adding biology? We would be happy to answer that question in a broad way by saying, well, in any case like this, I would encourage a student to think about the timing, their performance up to this point. Um, here's the policy that it would apply to anyone. Here's the deadline that, that every student needs to be aware of. So we're happy to share out that sort of general information, but we just can't make it specific to the student's academic record. Now, if it's important that you have access to your students' protected academic information, I'm encouraging you to have these conversations this summer so that you're ready for those questions when they arise in the fall term. Um, if, if it's really important that you have access to the academic record, um, and there are some very valid reasons why that might be the case, you are able to ask your student to sign a FERPA waiver. The FERPA waiver allows the student to, to permit someone in the honors program to share academic information. They can be very specific about who they designate. The student can say, the honors program may share academic information with my mother and no one else, or they may share academic information with anyone who asks. They can be general or specific, uh, but the student has to fill out the waiver themselves in order for us to be permitted to share the information. And without that waiver in place, um, it, it just delays our ability to converse with parents or any other interested party about their academic progress. Are there any questions I can answer about that? What is the difference between a mentor and an advisor? An advisor is a professional trained staff member who is deeply familiar with the LSA curriculum and is able to connect students with resources both in LSA and outside of LSA. Um, we're, we're not as familiar with other schools and colleges curricula, but we can certainly connect students to other advisors where they can get them the best advice there. Um, we talk with students about academic matters, 
we help them get connected in co-curricular and extracurricular ways. Um, we connect them to research opportunities um, and we monitor their academic progress and we support them all the way through to graduation. Mentors are not necessarily staff members. Um, they might be other students who have more experience on campus or a special interest in helping a lower division student, you know, find their way on campus. Uh, a mentor might come through a, an extracurricular organization. Uh, there are a lot of pre-professional organizations and societies on campus, and older students will often mentor younger students as they're applying for a Ross minor or thinking about, you know, getting ready for the MCAT. Um, so mentors can come in any form. They can be students, they can be faculty, they can be other staff. Um, they can be wellness coaches with a special focus on um, well-being. They could even be, um, yeah, I think that's probably that's probably my best ability to differentiate between a mentor and an advisor. And they're not mutually exclusive. An advisor could be a mentor. Does that help? So I'm seeing other questions as well. Let me. Are, are there orientation about billing and payments? Um, all of the information about tuition um, would come through the Office of Tuition and or financial aid. So we in honors typically direct students to those offices and their parents to those offices. Um, we don't present any orientation information about billing and payments. If a student does not complete or receive the sophomore honors level, but remains in honors, will they still graduate with honors? Yes, absolutely yes. Oh, and Rohit, please go ahead. Were you going to address that live? Or? Oh, no, I was just kicking that off to you. But. Oh, OK. Oh, you would like me to address the live? Yes, the answer is, <laughs> sorry. Yes, if a student does not uh, earn the sophomore honors award, they, they absolutely may graduate with honors um, as long as they complete all the other uh, requirements. How do we submit a FERPA waiver? Is it needed one time or every semester? The FERPA waiver is completed by the student and it is good for one year. And the, um, the link to the waiver can be found at the link on that webpage that's, that's there. Okay, are there any questions that we haven't answered? I realize we're a little past 6 p.m. Becca is typing an answer. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions that we can answer before we conclude? Okay, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. I hope we were able to answer all your questions. We have so enjoyed meeting the students who have already joined us at orientation and we're looking forward to meeting those who are yet to come. Good night.